Please welcome Larry LeBlanc and his guest, Arthur Fogel. Thank you very much. Um, I'll say somewhat similar if you were at an earlier uh, panel that I did uh, this morning with Michael Cole. If you've gone to a concert uh, in the last 20, 30 years, uh, one of the people that was going to be behind it, and this is in not just Canada, it's not just North America, it's Europe worldwide, but one of the people almost certainly behind it would be Arthur Fogel, now a star of his own film and TV series and likely coming, endorsements, uh, 360 deals, the whole thing. You're a private person. This is different for you. <laughs> well, it is different, that's for sure. Um, you know, the, uh, the, the idea for the film came from... Uh, an old friend of mine, Ron Chapman, who in fact was uh, one of the owners of The Edge when I worked there, and um, we continued our friendship through the years. And several years ago, he approached me about this, the idea of doing this documentary, and I um, really had no interest and resisted for some time. And then um, um, he wisely went to my wife and... Um, suggested that she convince me because it was really a great thing for, it uh, would be a great thing for our children. Um, and she agreed, so then she convinced me and I agreed to do it. You happy with the results? I am happy. Um, you know, it's, it, it, it really is quite good. It's difficult for me. I've only seen it once and it was kind of difficult to watch it. But, <laughs> um, you know, it, he, he did a great job, and, and a lot of really great artists and, and people in the industry participated. And, and I think the, uh, the messaging throughout having nothing to do with me is, is pretty spot on. I was reading um, this week, uh, they had a, a totals of uh, artists of what they made in their careers uh, in 2012. And right at the top of the list was Madonna with... Um, 34.6 million. Now, I realize that's a printed figure out, out of a magazine and, and things like that, but that was an extremely successful uh, tour. 88 dates altogether? Yes, it was 88 worldwide shows. I, you know, the interesting thing about Madonna is that um, from the start of her career until uh, I became involved, which was in 2000, she had done a grand total of two tours. Um, so, and you didn't start off at the promoter with her at all, did um, you? you? I did you, in you, Toronto, you, yeah. and I, I did her shows here. There was uh, I did Meta, uh, Maple Leaf Gardens, and then she came back uh, on the next tour and did uh, the Sky Dome, um, which is now the Rogers Center. But um, at that time, you know, she wasn't a touring act, and it really wasn't part of of you know, her ongoing career. And so in basically, what was it, 16 or 17 years, she turned to her twice. And then since 2000, through the, the MD&A tour last year, it was her fifth tour um, in 12 years. And amazingly, she had been to so few places in the world, um, you know, prior to 2000, that, that, you know, it really presented the opportunity to go to a lot of places and um, ended up being, you know, really successful. What, what takes in the consideration of being a, a, a global act? At one time, it used to be if they were selling records in foreign markets, then, okay, we can take them there. But it hits me today, you know, with um, record sales not being quite the barometer uh, of what they once were, uh, there has to be all kinds of other ingredients now, everything from uh, 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 cultural distinctiveness, if you want, uh, different things within the country. I mean, how do you know? And I, I'm going to ask you an example, okay? Lady Gaga, because that's one of the newest artists, you know, to get within that echelon. At what level do you look at, hey, I think it's possible we can really put together a full-scale global tour. What are all the ingredients? Well, you know, there are many ingredients. I think, I think generally it's a lot easier today than it, than it used to be on any number of levels. I mean, when we started... You know, uh, in 1989, when we did our first global tour um, with the Rolling Stones, um, it was it was a very different landscape 
um, throughout the world, and 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 in the, the you know the 20 plus years um, since, you can you you can see the development um, across the globe, whether it's uh, Asia, Latin America, uh, the Middle East, Eastern Europe as as concert markets. It's really. Um, created a, an entirely new sort of global landscape for touring. Well, there never used to be, you know, first off, the venues in Europe, certainly, and even for years and years, it wasn't the uh, venues in China. Uh, your competitor, AEG, has, two, you know, two venues. They're now, they're now building a third. So those routes are, are sort of expanding now where, you know, India has finally, you know, come in as a bigger market than it was. Uh, the idea of global marketing, uh, pardon me, global touring, 20, 30 years ago was, okay, we'll do England, Australia, might go up to Japan <laughs> and go to Germany. That was, right. your, that was your global tour, where today, you know, your tour could start out in Singapore. Well, uh, that, all true. And, and, you know, it was certainly back in the late 80s when this, you know, strategy sort of started to evolve. It was the Wild West. Um, if you could get into some of these places at all. So, you, you know, the transformation... The promoter, promoters there didn't want you there either. No, promoters definitely didn't want us there. They didn't want us here. Um, <laughs> but it, it was, um, you know, it, it, it's an incredible transformation on, on a global scale. And at the same time, so, sort of overlaying this, you have uh, the obvious with respect to, um, you know, the transformation with recorded music and the sale of recorded music. And ultimately, you know, the, uh, the, the importance of uh, playing live for, um, for artists uh, to generate income that, that they've had to, you know, sort of replace on, on the recorded side, I think has, you know, helped to, to generate much more touring activity globally as well. I think also the recorded album if you want today i realize it's tracks and streaming and all uh, uh, other different things but the recorded album was um the vessel if you want that everybody sort of evolved around today it's only one element of the overall package i was just sitting here thinking does you two ever need another hit record again does madonna ever really need another hit record again uh, the rolling stones have not really had a real hit record in years and years Yet that's a you know a high end probably will be a high in demand um, concert tour if they if, if they do the twenty days they're talking about if only to see if Keith Richards is still alive at the end of it, but I mean what I'm getting at is at one point the reason you toured was that album entity, and the reason you could tour was because it happened, but you don't need a hit record for Madonna you don't need a hit record for you too. Well, certainly when I started. Um, at CPI in the early 80s, um, it was all about the record and everything that was done, you know, in terms of touring or promotional activity um, was really about driving record sales mm -hmm. and, and the tour or shows was just one, one sort of component or driver. But, you know, I, I, again, there's this amazing transformation that's taken place where, um, you know, really live shows uh, the concert business has become the center in the universe and the driver for everything else. And um, I don't think any of us could have imagined, um, you know, that that would be how it unfolded over the last 20 years. It's it's pretty extraordinary. It's interesting with the Rolling Stones uh, going out and uh, Paul Dainty and uh, Virgin Group uh, allegedly and going for press reports now, not being able to come up with the rest of the money that's needed to finance the tour. They did the... Uh, um, the, the other dates in, uh, over in England and uh, the New Jersey date. Um, somebody said there's only two entities that can finance a tour of this ilk at this time. One is AEG, the other is Live Nation. And, um, I, you know, I know in talking with Michael Cole, who had done, of course, five of the tours before, when you sit down and look at these figures and stuff like that, did the you, when when Paul Dainty dropped out, did Live Nation take a look at stepping in at any point? No, we didn't. Um, really, the you know the the history of the Rolling Stones had always been Michael's, um, and you know we had worked on uh, all of the tours with him, but but it was really his uh, you know his relationship, and so um, you know I, I think. 
it, it's a strange circumstance because, you know, I think ultimately when, when it only becomes about the money, um, I don't know, for me and, and, and to a certain extent, I know this is going to sound strange, um, I think for Michael as well because, um, you know, there, there's a certain, uh, a certain skill and, and experience and ability that he has and that, you know, I have in part learned from him. Um, and while the, while the calmer side of it is, is, uh, is, is really, you know, critical, obviously, um, if, you can't, if you can't do it, if you can't execute the way it should be executed for a level, a level of that artist, um, th then I'm not sure you should be in the game. There's also a point, though, where you've got to sit there and go, these numbers don't make sense. And you would have had in going in, I know you had, going in looking at a 50th anniversary tour for the Rolling Stones, all sides, because technically you were in a part, uh, Live Nation was in a partnership situation with Michael Cove, there had been a, you know, a Rolling Stone tour. Somewhere along the line, somebody looked somewhere down the line and went, this doesn't make sense for us to do this. And, 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 and you gotta admit, Arthur, they've had a sweet spot you know, in terms of the concert market because everybody wants to see them. This may be the last tour, but financially for a promoter, there's maybe no futures. And the money level is really, really, really high, and you sit there at night and go, does this make sense to do this? Well, I, you know, listen, I, I think ultimately um, everyone, no matter what, what sector of this industry they're in, needs to maintain a, a certain level of uh, integrity as it relates to what, the, you know, risk-reward, you know, what, what they're paid for services, etc. And, you know, certainly for me, I can't speak for anybody else, um, I, I definitely... Uh, a long time ago, took the decision that if, if, if it wasn't an acceptable level of, of reward for risk, um, then maybe somebody else should do it. And, and I think that, you know, the unfortunate part of, about a, our business um, is that there are those people who undervalue themselves um, and, and allow the, the, the sort of margins and, and formulas of, of business to get uh, completely perverted. Without getting into when or why Live Nation pulled back from 360 deals or anything like that, and I'm not that interested because it's been written up a lot of times before, but you were involved in the early negotiations, you know, with Madonna as part of this overall deal, and in, you know, of course, after that came Jay Z, you know, came Nickelback, you know, a number of other ones, U2, uh, of course, uh, you know, as well, um, and I'm using. A 360 is just an, an overall envelope. You, you, I, th I believe you know what I'm talking about. I take it that you've now had five years to see if that model works. It's obviously working for you guys. But I understand why you maybe Live Nation wouldn't want to go too far and take on a whole slew of these. You stopped. It's conservative. But you've had now to have five years to evaluate what you did. And what conclusions have you come to? Um, I think we came to the conclusion that we made the right decision not to be in that business. <laughs> but uh, no, does, I, does I, pay, I, but, but does it pay no, off on a Madonna like, tour? I, th I think it goes like this. No, the, 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 they're all successful, yeah. um, and and you know we we don't regret for a minute having done those those three sixty structured deals with those artists. I, th I think the reality is, you know, when when Michael Rapino. Um, and, and myself, to some degree, um, spun out from Clear Channel in 2005 to create Live Nation. It was uh, this strange company with many different parts, none, none that made sense uh, as one. And, and so, you know, the first order of business was to completely strip away all of the other businesses to the core of, of what we wanted to be, which was the biggest and best uh, you know, live promotion, live concert company in the world. And, you know, as you go along in time, we, we were very successful at doing that. Uh, then there was this kind of blip where, you know, there was the moment of maybe we should be in the 360 deal business. But the truth is, you know, we are, in my view, the best live promotion company in the world. And that's what we should do. Um, and so that's what we do. Yeah.
We, we're not a record company. We're not, a, you, you know what I mean? We're, we are, we are what we are, you know? Well, you're also, part of the company is also a venue owner too, which is a whole other type of business because you pick the, that up from, uh, you know, d different oh, sources as well too. It, it's a little trickier today. How do you operate your global division separate from uh, mm -hmm. Live Nation? Uh, the the rest of it because you've got a global tour in Europe. Uh, you've got, a lot of core of your people are still here in Toronto. You work out, and at the same time, if they're building or doing different things uh, over in Europe, you've got a responsibility to the overall company as well to you know become like that. And how do how do you evaluate that? Well, uh, for me, I, I, I really have uh, two hats at Live Nation. One, one is as the chairman of music and, and uh, you know, touring. And so, um, you know, on a big picture sense, I, I work with Michael and help, you know, sort of orchestrate and, and manage the, the, that activity throughout the entire company. At the same time, my other hat is that I'm, um, you know, the president of Global Touring and, and it in and of itself is a is a, I guess a boutique operation within the company um, that you know specializes in promoting and producing global tours f for a handful of clients. It, it it's a and, and within there you do all your own marketing and everything as well yes, too. Yes, it's, yeah. it's a yeah. self contained self contained unit yeah. and and it's you know it's it's a particular skill set and and many of the artists uh, you know that that are a part of global touring we're fortunate to have had as as clients for a long time. And um, you know we've we've got a good a, a, you know a great bunch of people who have you know uh, a great understanding of the of the world and I and I think that's you know what really differentiates us because um, you know when when I'm talking to I don't know pick an artist Lady Gaga and 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 she sees me as her tour promoter she wants to know that. Um, when I'm talking about Tokyo or Abu Dhabi, that I know what I'm talking about. It isn't just Cleveland or L.A. You know, so if you're gonna if you're gonna play on that level, you need to have ha you know developed your expertise on that level. We we talk about how do you find out or pick up artists. Um, if I recall, Troy Carter talked to Paul McGinnis of U2. Uh, who's the best promoter for Lady Gaga to go around the world? Your, your name came up, which is kind of a um, odd relationship. Troy Carter having a mentor relationship with Paul McGinnis, but but there are very few artists that do work on that level. I found that really. I don't. I don't know if that's story true, but I, I think it is. It is true. Yeah. Um, you know. I, I. You know. Certainly, Paul McGinnis is is. Um, one of the brightest um, people I've ever met in my life. He's a, he's a, he's an unbelievable man manager in terms of um, you, know, you know the big picture, and he's he's played such a vital role in guiding you know the career of YouTube for for all these years. And um, I, I think kudos to Troy and anybody else who who looks to somebody like Paul um, to, to get advice because, you know, there's, there's, you know, for all of us and whatever we do in the business, there's a million stories in the naked city. Um, and probably most of them are bullshit, but <laughs> you know, so, so you sort of have to go to where you, you, you can feel the, the, the trust and the knowledge. No, we're not sure if you were at U2's first appearance in Toronto, it was at the Alma Combo, but we do know you were at the second one. And the second one is really an interest. When they played here at the Alma Combo, they played the uh, night after John Lennon uh, was shot dead. The second time they played here, they played a venue that I'm not sure most of the people in Toronto could even find, Maple Leaf Ballroom up on St. Clair. That's right. What the hell were you thinking? <laughs> <laughs> they used to bring in Irish show uh, bands. Yeah, there. I don't know. I mean, we thought it was a great idea. You know, it was owned by a couple of Irish brothers and... Wouldn't it make sense? To, it was a very cool room, but quite frankly, the only reason the show got in there is because it was U2 uh, and obviously Irish, and, and they had no interest really in, in dealing well, with Well, they did show bands cars. up there. They did the, yeah, these Irish yeah. show bands. You, exactly. There was an IRA bar down the street on Dover Court you could have had, you know. Yeah. That might have worked a little bit better. Right. Any idea how many people were there? I don't remember. I think about 1,000. Wow. 1, That's good. Yeah. And did that help cement the relationship with Paul and McGinnis and the band? Or did, did Riddy get cemented after they see uh, the work uh, 
that you did with the with the Rolling Stones, because you did a lot of the advance work, particularly abroad, uh, with the Stones in 1989, and nobody thought when you were at CPI that CPI could carry this off. Yeah, you grabbed it away from, uh, you know, Bill Graham. Yeah, you did this. Yeah, you know, North America, you guys had done victory and stuff like that. To go into Europe, where some of these promoters had been out there for 200 years, it feels. Nobody thought you could carry it. I, I think, was that not one of the things that impressed Paul? Uh, I think it was, yes. You know, it was, listen, uh, it, it was one of those examples of, you know, shoot first, ask questions later, because we, we, you know, the good news was we got the tour, and then the bad news was, holy shit, you know, <laughs> what, what do we do now? You didn't and, have a clue, did you? And, and the bizarre part is, you know, before we did that Rolling Stones deal, and I don't know if Michael brought this up, but, you know, we, we were kind of sitting around and, and it was, you know, the 11th hour before we put this large amount of money on the table for that Steel Wheels tour. And um, we decided we were going to divvy up some promoters um, around the world and we'd each call some and just, just get a sense of what they really thought about the Stones because we had just gone blindly ahead here, right? So we meet back at the end of the day and, and we all have the same story, which is everybody thinks the Stones are done, it's over, we're out of our minds. Oh, really? Yeah. Wow. And so we, we, I remember sitting there and going, well, either they're all full of shit or, you know what I mean? Because they so, hadn't toured for a couple of years at that time too, uh, yeah. I think it was... Four uh, years. It was even longer. I think yeah. it might have been eight years. Yeah. And so, you know, it was one of those uh, moments in time where you sit there and you go, no, they're wrong, we're right. And we went for it, and that was really the, the launching pad for so many great things, including, you, you know, in part, the U2 uh, yeah. relationship. Well, one of the things that came out of there, of course, is um, you outmaneuvered, outbid, however word we want to use, Bill Graham, and uh, who never forgave CPI. But you got the uh, wonderful occasion to be in a room with him when he lambasted you, and you guys went head to head, and apparently uh, you held your own. It was um, that the Billboard conference in New York. Is that yeah, where it, it was? Actually, uh, the, uh, the North American Concert Promoters Association <laughs> meeting at, at a hotel in New York, and we were all in the boardroom, and uh, some, somehow, you know, we got into it, and, and Bill. Uh, just kind of went nuts. Um, that kind of. He, yeah. He, 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 I, I believe he, the word. He wasn't happy. Let's I, put I, it I that believe way. the word was uh, CPI is ruining the business and your parasites. Yeah. Well, it, it was even more personal than that. I know that it was because he 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 um, he had a problem with Canadians, but you know ultimately um, he he was uh, he was a larger than life figure and and he you know a very emotional guy and. You know, it was a. Uh, you know, the Rolling Stones were near to dear, near and dear to his heart. But ultimately, you know, they had decided to make a change. So, you know, um, I, I think it worked out pretty well for the Rolling Stones. You wrote you wrote out CPI USA going into the states. You were one of the ones involved with that. Not well loved having the Canadians come into the American market, and uh, a lot of people were very vocal about that. Uh, certainly. Uh, Ron Delsner in New York, John Shear, I don't think has ever gotten over it. Our friend down in Atlanta, Alex Cooley, uh, is still bitter about it to this day. Was there that much resentment against you guys? Because you started off buying Barry Fay and buying into a number of different, uh, you know, CC out of, you know, uh, out of, uh, out of uh, the Carolinas, those type of agencies. Was there a lot of resentment about the Canadians? Well, there was tremendous resentment. Uh, uh, you know, I think the fact we were Canadians, you, you know, was was another dimension. Don't you just love the Americans being pissed off about Canadians instead of the other way around for a change? Exactly. You know? But it was, I don't know, you know, we were a real threat to um, a system that had been established um, that, that really, when you went to the core of it, it, it was a system that was established to make sure that the control of the business rested in someone else's hands other than the promoter. You didn't give a shit that you broke up the system, do you? No, not at all. It was the smartest thing that we ever did, frankly. And, and you, you know, did, did, the, did you... the truth is in life that there, there are any number of systems or, or setups on, on how things operate, but it doesn't mean they're right or they're good. You know? Did you also see it as a corrupt system? 
It was it was very tightly controlled, and it, and it was uh, by by you know a handful of people, and it, and it was uh, it was like the mob, you know. Yeah. Basically, you you've got Philadelphia, and you got uh, you know L.A. and don't you dare, you know, step out of your your market, or we'll have to. Well, the only person, the only person that jumped, that we, we should uh, explain to people that don't follow the industry and aren't as old as us, I guess. Um, back then, there were uh, 20, 25 entities, promoters in each area, and they ran uh, their little region like empires. And essentially, when a tour was booked, uh, it was booked by Frank Barcelona or somebody at Premier Artists, and essentially you went into those territories. Uh, there were a few people that would um, work with other promoters around. Uh, Graham sometimes would partner with it. Jerry Weintraub would take concerts west anywhere that he felt like. Bill Graham, you know, your territory used to be the argument, any part of the United States that he flew over. But basically... These were like little kingdoms that were built up, as CPI was for, for Toronto for a long yep. time. I mean, you guys, yep. you guys benefited from that system. For sure. And, and, you know, listen, I mean, the system is still in place. Yeah. I, think, I think our only, you know, our, our sort of big picture point was that there are different ways that you can come at this. It just isn't about doing it that way. Um, and, you know, that, that system is still in place and is, and is very... Uh, effective and important for a lot of people in the business. Um, so I, I, I don't want to uh, demean it whatsoever. But, you, you know, it's just th there has to be, or in our minds, there had to be a way for us to do business the way we wanted to do it as well. Concert um, Productions International morphed into, and I'm going to try and do this really quickly because there's about nine different companies here, but I'll make it really quickly, in, in the BCL, in the TNA, which ended up getting bought by SFX. SFX. That's essentially how you became in the part of the SFX, which went into Clear Channel, which was broken off into Live Nation. There's your education thing, right? All within the sentence. Did you have any apprehension at all where... Essentially, it was just, you know, you and the organization of the people that you'd worked with, that you'd grown up with, the Canadians, all of a sudden being part of a bigger entity under SFX, where Robert Silverman came in and gave everybody, all right, we're going we're gonna to put all these crying, fighting kittens into one bag. All of a sudden, you're now not working for one person. You're working for, you know, Silverman and a whole bunch of different people. And then they get sold to clergy. Uneasy days within those days? Um, not really for me. I mean, uh, you, you know, I had ultimate faith and confidence that we would get to a place uh, that was that was great and, and with someone that was great in charge. And that's exactly where we got to when Live Nation spun off with Rapino yeah. as the CEO. The truth is there's a lot of people who look at um, our business or any business really um, with a view that big is bad. And now, sometimes that's true. Um, but in the case of our business, um, and certainly in my view, how Live Nation has evolved, it's not bad at all. It is the best opportunity any smart manager could ever want. Because, you know, on the one hand, everybody sits there and wants to shit all over the recorded side of the business and how it, you know, it isn't what it used to be in acts. It's hard for acts to break, and there's no budgets for you know promoting and marketing and tour support and all those kinds of things that used to exist with respect to developing artists. Okay, so now we've created this incredible machine, global machine, global platform that is the best possible um, you know marketing uh, driver you could ever want for your band, and people want to complain that somehow it's the big man, bad monster. Well, the truth is, it's only a big bad monster to the people who haven't figured out how to use it to their advantage. And all the smart managers that, you know, work within the Live Nation world have figured out exactly how to do that. And it's, you know, it, it's a, a great vehicle for them. One of the interesting things was, um, as you are well aware of, under SFX, Silliman had a big meeting in uh, Nashville with all the promoters that he had bought all these different companies and all the promoters were supposed to get up and somebody said drop their pants and show how they did deals and nobody wanted to do it. How has Rapino, Michael Rapino, been able to meld this company because he took over, you know, this side of it, you know, uh, 
2005. Yeah, in 2005, after coming from Europe, and the background with you, you know, of course, up here when he was with Labatt, but how has he been able to get away and correct all those regional divisions that were in the company? Because they, they, they just riddled the company. Well, I, you know, I, I think it comes down to um, he, he, he has great vision, he's a great strategist, and he's a great leader. And people pretty much uh, across the board, and if they haven't, they're probably gone, but people have bought into those things, his vision, his strategy, and, and his leadership. And I think... It had to make some painful changes. I'm thinking here in 20, uh, 2011 where you set up uh, two separate things and, uh, no and, and, and had, to, had to have some people leave the organization that had been there a long time. It, it's, it, it's a big company and it's a tough gig, you know, and, and it's global and, it, you know, there's a lot of moving parts and, and a lot of, you know, issues in politics. But I think, you know, at the end of the day, he's done a masterful job in, in guiding it. Um, and it's, uh, you know, for someone like me, um, you know, the, I get the, boast of, the best of both worlds. You know, I have uh, kind of the global team that I have that, with great expertise, and then I can, you know, layer that on top of this great uh, platform of local promoters that Live Nation has built uh, around the world. It's interesting um, watching the different changes and growth of Live Nation in terms of an evolution, because as you know, in 2011 and 2010, they went through ticketing issues, uh, particularly over one of the, I remember one of the, uh, uh, the ill-fated Lilith Fair tour where everybody lost money, including Network, you guys, everybody. But essentially the biggest complaints was when tickets are, are put on, what point do you drop them, what have you. That was a big lesson, I think, for your organization was, hey, we're screwing up here. We've got to figure this, we got to, we got to figure something out here. Because it, it, certainly what you were doing wasn't working. You know, I, listen, I, you know, every situation is different and lessons are learned. And uh, I, I think, you know, for me, part of, the, uh, part of the excitement about doing what I do and being in this business is that, you know, always learning something haven't seen it all. There's always stuff going on that, that you know, you have to, that, that causes you to pause and look at how you do business um, and how you come at things. And I, and I think ultimately that's a really healthy and positive thing. Um, and, you know, if we were right all the time, I, I don't know, I'd probably be lying on a beach. What about paperless ticketing? Because it's one thing that you guys have been really leading with. Um, at the same time, Madonna goes over to the UK and works with a sponsorship with a, with a secondary uh, you know, ticketer a couple years ago. That seems to be mixed messages. Uh, it seems to me that the industry does still not have its handle on that side of the business. Um, well, I think, you know, everybody's uh, kind of feeling their way through, through that whole thing. Uh, you know, ticketing world, uh, particularly in the second, secondary ticketing market. It's, it's, you know, it's a fact of life and it's not going away. End of story. You know, it, it's just like uh, you can say to people, hey, tomorrow, can everybody just stop downloading music without paying? Um, you, you know, it, it's like you, things evolve. You can't turn back the hands of time and the secondary market isn't going away. So you've got to figure out how to deal with it and sort of navigate through it and... Trial and error. I see Greg waving. Greg, I'm going to take three minutes. Uh, no, there's no Q&A. Okay. okay, but we got up stage here and it said 28 minutes. Yep. So how long can we go? Uh, we have to over anyway, so okay, so I can go 10 minutes? Five more. Five more. You've got it like that. Five years ago, um, Michael leaves the company. Cole, painful time for you? Um, I mean, you're good friends. Yeah. You've grown up, you're working together. Uh, somebody who shared your vision, you guys have built something. Hey, listen, you, you know, he, he I, I think Donald Kedolan might be here in the room. There he is over there. Donald, Michael, Norman Perry, uh, you know, you couldn't ask for three greater mentors. Um, they, they gave me my shot. They, they taught me the tricks of the trade, some of which I don't use anymore. Uh, <laughs> um, but, you know, 
It, it was upsetting um, because, uh, you know, there's a long history there and uh, I have a tremendous uh, amount of respect for Michael. But you know what? It came and went and we're, uh, you know, things are fine and we talk often. It's a little, it's a little upsetting not to see him in the film. Um, it is, and you know, you'd have to uh, berate Ron about that. I, th I think it was more circumstance than it was, it was a circumstance by design. There were some legal issues at yeah. that point between Livation and him because the story, you know, runs somewhat parallel. The yeah, same. I agree. Are you um, enormously proud, as a number of us are, of the number of Canadians that are on the live music side? And it isn't just your own company. We have, of course, Deborah Rothwell, you know, over at A. E.G., uh, you can argue, I have a lot of fun when we talk about producers like Daniel Lanois changing the landscape of the world and Bob Ezrin and people like that. Canadians change the landscape of live music worldwide. I mean, I mean, I mean do you have to be a Canadian to work at the Live Nation? Because that's the joke that Bob Lefsitz made. Yeah, well, I, that figures. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, come on, he loves you. But the... Um, the, the truth is, and I, again, I go back to Donald, Michael, Norman, the, the, there was this incredible, you know, company. Um, that hell, of a, hell of a shop when you think about it. It's, the people it's that amazing. Were, and you were behind yeah. that horrible uh, shopping center, uh, you know, behind the... Terrible offices. Uh, at one point, they were behind a grocery store, Terrible behind offices. the docks. I agree. Where I they agree. Where they threw out the rotten food. <laughs> you know? <laughs> All true. But, but, you know... The, but, but tremendous stable. Great, great talent, um, you, you know, I mean, whether it's Riley O'Connor, who still runs uh, Live Nation yep. Canada, or Deborah, doing so well at AEG, or Jerry Baird, who works with me, Mark Norman, Susan Rosenberg, I mean, you, you can go on and on Joey, and on. you know. And now, Scalari. down in LA, you got Joy, Joy Scaleri, Steve you got Herman. Brett Gallagher, you got Steve Herman. Um, I'm the only Canadian that never got a job at Live Nation, apparently. Yes. You know, they're still working in the business. My son, maybe my daughter will get it, Don't, you know? You know, it's not too late. It's but, <laughs> you know, it, it, it's, uh, it, it really is extraordinary. And, and I think, you know, we have this incredible bond amongst us uh, because of those days and that, that whole learning experience. And um, we really had something special. And, um, you know, it taught us great skills. And we're all still out there using those skills. You got four almost five tours going out over the next two years. You know, it's quite a few. You want to name them? Because I think, yeah. I hope I can name them. I, I think I've got um, the, I, well, I, I, you, I, through I, this year, um, I, I have a Rihanna tour that's just started worldwide and um, uh, followed by a Beyonce who's starting this summer and Justin Timberlake who's touring solo this fall. Yeah. He's doing some dates with Jay-Z um, this summer, some stadium dates, a handful. And um, next year, you know, I, I think um, it, it's likely that uh, you 2 will be out on the road. There's, uh, it's hopeful there'll be new music sometime in the next six to eight months. Smaller stage, too, I hope. Smaller stage. Um, you got Sting. You got Sting working. And uh, I don't have working, but I absolutely uh, hope and pray he'll be working is David Bowie, because he should be working. Well, you did... Um, but I will tell you, I, I've tried every angle for eight years, and he doesn't seem too Yeah, but nobody thought he'd be recording, too, That's and he's true. been recording with Tony Visconti for the, uh, the, you know, as you know, for the last three years. They did 17 songs, got it down to 12. Um, I'm talking to Tony, and uh, we never know, but what people... I will, I will tell you one story, though, about David. This the recent, this Christmas, um, I sent an email to him um, I had just signed a new deal at Live Nation, so I thought I would send him an email saying, uh, David, the only reason I signed a new deal at Live Nation is in the hope that you would tour in the next five years before I'm un unemployable. And I sent it to him, and I got a response, L-O-L. <laughs> it's the truth. So we... And I said to my wife, wow, David Bowie writes L-O-L. What happened to OMG? We now know David Bowie's uh, tricks. One people do forget, though, is that after Steel Wheels, the next tour, world tour that you did was with Bowie, I believe. Yes, it was. So that's a long relationship going back and forth. You it know? is, and he's, he's an incredible artist, incredible artist. I want to thank Arthur for being here. I want to thank you for being here, and thank you very much.